Hello and welcome to the Portrait Sculpting course. In this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the mouth. The lips can be very expressive. There's a bunch of muscles that attach around the lips, allowing us to make various expressions and shape our mouth as we talk. The bucolabial group of muscles that all come in and attach to the lip that we went over in the lesson on the anatomy of the face shows just how many options and possibilities there are when it comes to moving the lips. Just like all of the other facial features, the lips can vary a lot from person to person, but there are some common forms that we should be looking for when we're representing the lips. Let's go over some of these basic forms. A common mistake that I see beginners make is to build the lips on too flat of a foundation. The lips aren't stuck onto a flat surface. The skull has the tooth cylinder or the barrel of the mouth or the mound of the mouth that bends forward quite a bit when you look at it from above and also from the side view. So this barrel of the mouth or mound of the mouth or dental mound, it creates quite a bit of roundness of a round surface that the lips are then built on top of. Here you can see on this simplified version of the skull that the two cylinder has these flat sides and then a rounded bubble shape that balloons out from the surface. This is the primary form upon which the lips are built. So when you're sculpting the portrait, it's a good idea to build out this dental mound so that you can then build the lips on top of this primary form. Before moving on, let's also take a look at the form of the chin. There's a rounded W-shaped rhythm that separates the tooth cylinder from the chin. And that plays an important role in the shape of the mouth and how the form of the lower lip transitions into the chin. Now that we have an understanding of the foundation of the lips, let's go over some of the anatomy of the mouth. The red part of the lips, that are vermilion in color are called the vermilion. The lips terminate at the corners of the mouth at the oral commissures. That sounds fancy. The oral commissures. Surrounding the vermilion or colored part of the lips is the vermilion border. This is a soft, fleshy ledge or bump in the surface. The vermilion border at the top part of the lips is called the cupid's bow because of its resemblance to a curved bow. So this upper part of the lips, that's the cupid's bow. Something to keep in mind is that the outside corners of the cupid's bow spiral inward as they tuck into the lip. So if we were to trace this cupid's bow, it starts more forward in space and then as it starts to tuck in, it kind of curves around and then tucks in to the mouth, kind of spirals into the mouth. Just outside the oral commissures are the nodes, which are soft bumps on either side of the corners of the mouth that are made from the many muscle attachments that control the lips and the fat pads that facilitate that movement. On this a corche you can see just how many muscles travel in towards those corners of the mouth. I like to think of a donut shape as the form of the soft nodes that turn in to the hole at the corner of the mouth those oral commissures. The five soft pillowy forms of the lips are called tubercles. The tubercles consist of three rounded forms on the top and two on the bottom. The way these forms are offset creates the flowing crease between the lips. Above the upper lip is the philtrum that has the two soft vertical hills and a valley between them. A common beginner mistake is making this upper part of the lip too thin, but there's quite a bit of fullness from the fat and muscles as well as from the shape of that dental mound. I like to imagine that there's a mustache of mass that raises this area of the upper lip and then continues over to around the nodes of the mouth. If you fail to build out this area, it makes the lips look strange. Surrounding this upper part of the lip that we could also call the mustache area is the nasolabial crease. This is just below the nasolabial fat pad that we went over in the premium lesson on the fat pads of the face. This crease begins above the wings of the nostril and then travels diagonally downward towards the outside corners of the mouth outside of those nodes of the mouth. This crease is more obvious on older people typically and then when you're young, it's nice and soft. On the lower lips, there are two soft column shaped forms that travel diagonally outward from the middle lower part of the lips 
towards the area just outside of the chin. These columns contribute to the rounded W shape of the transition from the mouth to the chin. Sometimes these columns will combine with other forms of the face to create a larger donut shaped form surrounding the mouth. When sculpting the lips, it's important to pay attention to that vermilion border and how the plane changes take place that surround the lips and transition to the mouth. This transition on the upper lip is soft and it starts deeper and then spirals out as it moves forward in space. You can especially see this from above as the upper lip is pushed out and forward in space by that dental mound. Pay attention to where the transition from the lips to the surrounding skin is abrupt and where it's soft and subtle. For example, on the lower lip, in the middle section, there's a sharp transition from the lip to the skin just under the lip. This transition creates a darker shadow shape under the mouth and contributes to the shape of the lower lip when you look at the face from the profile view. But as we move outward, this transition softens considerably. This is because the lower lip is transitioning to those two soft column shaped masses on some people, this is so soft that if there wasn't a color difference in the lips, you almost wouldn't see the transition as it moves into those column shapes. Let's look at the proportions of the mouth. If you take the distance from the bottom of your chin to the bottom of your nose, and you divide that into two, that's usually where the bottom part of your bottom lip is, where that sharp transition that we just talked about is, bottom of the chin. The crease between the bottom of the lips is usually about one third of the way down. So two thirds make up the bottom lip and chin and one third makes up this upper lip. When the face is relaxed and the mouth is closed, the corners of the mouth, the oral commissures, will be about as wide as the distance between the pupils of the eyes. So if you just look at the pupils in the middle of the eyes and then you just drop that down vertically, that usually gets you at about the corners of the mouth. You can also compare the corners of the mouth to the outside corners of the nostrils, just to make sure that the width of the nose compared to the width of the mouth looks right. These proportions are general guidelines, but there's a lot of variation from person to person. Some people have wider mouths, some people have thinner lips, some people have larger lips, and so just be aware of that as you're sculpting. And these measurements can change as you open your mouth or make expressions. Okay, now that we have an understanding of the forms of the mouth, it's time to sculpt it. While we will be using ourselves as a reference for this assignment, don't worry too much about getting the likeness perfectly correct. Instead, try to focus on these forms that we've gone over as you're sculpting the mouth. To sculpt this mouth study, I'll be using a simple study board that's about four inches by four inches, or 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Some clay, I'll be using Chavant Medium NSP clay. I'll also have two mirrors, as well as some photo references of myself that I took for the upcoming self-portrait sculpture assignment. It's especially important to have a reference of the profile view. Let's start by establishing the profile silhouette of the mouth from the side view. We can do this by building up a wall of clay and pressing it firmly onto the study board. Remember to build that center line far enough out so that you have enough space to add the correct depths of the mouth. Like the other facial feature studies, I like to show the surrounding features of the bottom of the nose and chin so that I can better understand how the mouth transitions into these other parts of the face. Next, we can draw in some guidelines that show us where the nostrils will be and the angle of the crease of the mouth from the side view. Now start to build up the forms of the mound of the mouth and the rounded mass of the chin so that we have these primary forms to build the secondary forms on top of. Then we can start to build out the lips with pieces of clay. Start with larger chunks of clay to quickly establish the mass of the forms, and then as the sculpture gets closer to finishing, use smaller pieces of clay to work on the details. Try to do as much as you can by adding clay, rather than by removing clay with a sculpting tool. This will help you achieve a more supple and lifelike appearance to the forms. As needed throughout the process, we can draw in guidelines with a knife or sculpting tool. Don't forget to change the angle that you're observing the sculpture from. Check it from above, check it from below, look at it from the side view. This will help you gain an understanding of how those forms exist in space. Once the forms are in place, you can start to smooth out the texture 
and finalize the details with a sculpting tool. Remember that softness and subtlety is usually preferable to over-exaggerated forms that don't blend together. This was a lot of stuff to cover in one video, so in the premium course, I'll slow it down and walk you through my process for sculpting this study. We'll also be sculpting a twice life-size sculpture study, which I think is more impressive and it's pretty fun. So hopefully I'll see you over in the premium course, which you can find at proco.com slash portrait sculpt. Your assignment is to do a life-size mouth study using yourself as a reference. You can submit images of your assignment over at proco.com under this lesson for a chance to have some of your work featured in the upcoming critique videos. This lesson was free. It's free to create an account over at proco.com. It's free to upload your work and get feedback from the Proco community. So there's really no excuse not to improve your sculpting abilities by doing the assignment. Stay productive, stay creative. I'll see you in the next lesson.